January 26, 2022. Robin, brother, how you doing? I'm doing super well, man. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And for those who are listening, thank you very much for joining another episode of the Four Limits Podcast. We've got Ryan and Robin here, your hosts. And uh, yeah, tonight we've got some great guests coming up here shortly. We've got uh, Mark Solomon, also known as Up North Brewing, uh, from the Indigenous Brew Crew and uh, Home Brewer. And we also have Chris Lee from High Gravity Supply Co. joining us. Um, another home brewer. We're going to talk about home brewing uh, tonight. So I'm stoked to talk about that. Just, you know, talk about recipe building, how they got started, um, you know, the keys to brewing today. Like, you know, how can you be innovative in your own small space? So there's lots of fun stuff to talk about. Um, but before we do that, let's catch up, Robin. And so what you've been up to the last week? Uh, you know, just kind of, uh, I guess not much, honestly, like this weather is really getting, <laughs> the, between the weather and the fact that we're locked down, it's literally not much, man. I've been locked up in the house. I, uh, o- over the holidays, got myself like a turntable set up. So I've been just spending some time playing with the turntables. I uh, had an MPC mini that uh, I got last year. So I was spending some time just on production, playing around. Nice. Um, but outside of that, yeah, yeah, you know, just kind of like I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of all music. Like hip hop just happens to be something that I'm especially drawn to. But like, it's, it's great to get to know music that much better. It's not like I'm going to become a producer or anything, but you know, it's nice to be able to understand music at that level that some of these other folks do, right? Just or a little bit more, a little bit closer to that level, if anything, right? But yeah, man, totally. that's that's uh, really it. Um, just kind of enjoying the week, um, getting back into work. Uh, but that's it. How about you, man? Uh, about the same. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it was a quiet weekend. I did, as I told you before, my dry January ended on Saturday. Um, so now it's dry January ish and, uh, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know what it, uh, it's just been, it's just been kind of crazy, you know, things that, like it were just still on the same shit and, yeah. and it was just like, you know, all right, I'm having a beer and yeah, I pour, it was like, I poured Ashley a drink and I was like, Ooh, and I didn't say anything. I was like, all right, I'm going to get a hot water. Yeah. And, and she could tell I was kind of like, man, you know, maybe I could have a beer tonight. And yeah. And uh, so she gave me the nudge and I obliged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we talked Not about this offline. <laughs> no, we talked about this offline, right? And, and the fact is that, you know, dry Jan is just about, and we talked about this, just kickstarting kind of yourself into good habits. You know, it's mm-hmm. not about necessarily holding yourself so firm to like, I'm going to make this through, right? It's just like any, any, any which way you kind of cleanse yourself and start those good habits is good. And one thing I've seen of you, Ryan, is like, yeah, you, you, you did that for a, a quite a bit of time in Jan and you picked up a lot of unbelievable habits. That tea, the tea fix you were on is just unbelievable. You know, that's great. I love the fact my tea. that you've been doing that. You're working <sighs> out again, that, nothing but good habits. Right. So, I mean, good yeah. for you for, you know, doing it as long as you did. And that's well, all thanks, brother. About, right. So, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I owe it to nobody, but me, right. And I'm 21, yeah. 21, 22 days is a solid run for yeah, man. compared to so. last year. I think that was all of last year combined without a beer. So <laughs> possibly, except for dry January last year, which also ended a couple of days early. So <laughs> you don't got to go the whole way. Uh, no, but no, other than that, just been working, getting ready to go ice fishing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, um, we got, so we got the, my buddy's built his hut and he's bringing it up Saturday morning. So we're going to prep it and get it ready to drag out Saturday or Sunday and uh, drill some holes and catch some fish, hopefully. Always got to christen the the fish hut with some fresh fish. So, yeah, man. I mean, get some of that in from. Uh, and I don't know why I'm looking this far ahead, but I was looking at the forecast for February and March just to kind of better understand what the next couple of months are going to look like. And they're saying it's going to be a uh, it's warmer than usual February, and uh, March looks like we're already going to start to see temperatures like 10, 11 degrees outside. So. Uh, get yeah. in as much of that ice fishing as you can man the cold weather outside it's a uh, perfect weather for ice fishing <laughs> it's perfect for it it's yeah, perfect yeah. for it but yeah so other than that and we got our episode 
and uh, doing the brew day with Mark, uh, of course, on uh, this Saturday as well. So it's going to be a busy Saturday. Yeah, it sounds like it. But heck, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a very eventful. I mean, you, you folks are doing the, uh, uh, the is it the Brave Brave Noise uh, yeah, the, Lab? Is that the one that you're going to be doing that day? Yes, the Brave Noise Collab. I've got a can of it here from uh, actually oh, from Farm that? League Brewing. Oh, so we're going to do the same collab, and uh, yeah, it was Mark's idea. I thought it was a great idea. It is. So yeah, let's do it up. Yeah. That's going to be awesome, man. And uh, have you ever been a part of March Brews before? Like, have you been there, watch them kind of go through the process? Nope. Oh, that's going to only be been, so cool. Only been when it's in process, like when it's brewing or it already in the keg. So yeah, yeah, we're, yeah it's okay. going to be fun to do top to bottom. So it's kind of be it's going to be a neat kind of follow up to this episode too. We're going to have a little YouTube special on it, like 15, 20 minutes of us just going through yeah. the brew process. That's so fun, man. Yeah, it'll be fun. I haven't like you know it's I haven't been involved in a brew in a very long time, so it's fun to be invested in the process and to get back yeah. to that learning component again that we talked about at the beginning mm-hmm. of the year. I think the um, last time, Ryan, I remember that you did something like that it was probably when we were both at Common Good doing that uh, IG Brew Crew brew. Is yeah, that is right? that one or I think Furnace Room down in... Um, oh, right. You did the Furnace Room one. Yeah. But yeah, so I missed that closeness to it, right? So it'll be cool yeah. to to get back to that. And of course, um, we've got ours coming up too, um, which we're just aligning on a style and uh, yeah. and some dates in February to get her done. So that's going to be fun too like the big one yeah yeah man that's gonna be super exciting yeah so you know feel free to leave in the youtube comments or on the uh, socials you know who else would you like to see us do a collab with or who would you like to see us do a collab with this year maybe we can make something happen yeah i'll tell you who i want to do one of the shacklands (laughs) yes you know if those guys are down that would be one i would absolutely love to do yeah i would love to get down and 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 a huge happy fifth birthday to shacklands as well they just had their fifth birthday on the weekend yeah man it looked like it was a blast yeah it did they had some live music yeah so big shout out to shacklands and yeah i I agree it would be fun to to do a nice belgian style beer with a little bit of a shacklands twist on it Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. absolutely um so yeah we uh, will join us after this little break we will have uh, mark and chris join us to talk about some home brewing and uh enjoy that and we are not going to talk about truckers on this show that i promise <laughs> definitely not all right everybody thanks for tuning in enjoy the interview in here all right, welcome back, everybody. Um, huge thank you to our guests tonight. We have Chris Lee from High Gravity Supply Co. and Mark Solomon, uh, one of the members of the Indigenous Brew Crew, both um, home brewers, extraordinaires, and they're here to talk to us today about uh, home brewing and just their experiences and and just you know home brewing in general. A little a uh, little small education episode today, we'll call it. Yeah, so thank you both for joining. Yeah, for any of those folks that uh, you know are out there, have been thinking about home brewing, wanting a home brew, small brew, one gallon brews, maybe five gallon brews, maybe they can get a little bit of education from your folks, and uh, you can share some of the challenges that you've been through, and uh, hopefully they don't have to go through the same. Absolutely. So why don't uh, you both? We'll get you guys to introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are, a little bit about your background in, in beer, and and we can go from there. We'll start with uh, you, Chris. No, Marco first. Uh, Mark. <laughs> But no, Chris, go first. No, <laughs> come on. It's one come hour on. You of the mom's going back. Uh, I'm Mark Solomon. Uh, I've been homebrewing for four or five years now. Um, member of the Indigenous Brew Crew. Uh, I do um, I've done a few like major collabs with uh, some of the bigger places, Catalyst, Shacklands, uh, People's Pint. So. Um, yeah, not a, like, you know, not a great brewing resume. I've, I've lost, how about this? I've lost more uh, more homebrew competitions than I've won. So. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I don't Perfect. know, Mark. That sounds like some pretty uh, <laughs> impressive collabs there. I mean, that sounds amazing. Right on. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so my name is Chris Lee. I'm uh, a home brewer, uh, graphic designer. I do, I have a label called High Gravity Supply Company. Shirts like this, 
Um, there you go, like that one too. Same kind of twinning in different uh, formats here. <laughs> um, I've been homebrewing since uh, about 10 years now, um, off and on. Um, I'm kind of weird like that because I, I, I had a very, I worked in the, the bar, restaurant, nightclub industry for about 10 years prior to that. So I had a lot of exposure to beer, liquor, all that kind of jazz. Um, and my brother ended up buying me a, a Mr. Beer kit for Christmas one year. And that just sort of cracked open the whole, the whole world. I was like, oh, cool. I can make beer. And I tried, I was like, I actually made a glass of beer. This is awesome. And I was just like, I was hooked immediately. Wanted to learn more. Um, yeah. And I just, here I am now. <laughs> nice. So both of you probably had this, a huge interest in craft beer before you started brewing. And, and Chris, you're saying, I mean, the, the transition for you, over to home brewing from just enjoying beers was that Mr. Beer Kit, which I'm sure a lot of people first start with. So Mark, how about for you? What was that kind of transition? When did you make that and why did you make that transition over to home brewing? You know, I, I, I for me, it's, it's about, uh, it's a bit of a retirement plan for me. Like I have this like dream and it probably is a pipe dream uh, the, the further I get into it. But I kind of realized I was like, I, I would really like to do a second career as a brewer, as an open, uh, an owner. And, and so I kind of thought like, once I'm done with my current day job or it's done with me, I'd like to open my own shop. So I probably should know how to, you know, make beer. Uh, so I started, I, I started doing that and um, actually finding a real enjoyment uh, doing it, the community that surrounds it and builds it. So yeah, it, yeah. Nice. And now, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of people kind of start with these Mr. Brew kits and they go from there. Now, my question to you, Chris, is how long did you continue to try to use Mr. Brew kits before you decided, like, I'm not going to go with these malt extracts. I'm going to create my own grain bill and start from there. Uh, pretty quick, actually. I, I, I uh, leveled up in small increments, but I did that. I did it pretty quickly. Um, I think that if I remember correctly, that Mr. Beer kit had, it came with two um, liquid malt extract cans. So it's basically like, it's just liquid work. It's just really condensed. So it takes out all the, the grain portion of brewing beer, which is good because then you can focus on, okay, this is how long I have to do this part, this part for, this is when I have to add hops. So it's an easier way to get in, get a kind of get started in the whole process. And I, like, there's a lot of steps when you're making beer. I mean, I don't really think about it now, but at the time I was like, you know, read okay, 10 minutes, put this thing in. Like, you got to really okay. pay attention to what you're doing, right? Um, I quickly, I think I did maybe three batches on, with liquid malt extract, the Mr. Beer kits. And then I bought a kit from Brooklyn Brew Shop, which is an all grain one gallon kit. Mm -hmm. And then I just started adding pieces and more things here and there. And yeah, I just kind of leveled up from that. And um, I moved to, I was living, actually moved from Toronto to the UK a number of years ago. So I had to sell all my stuff here. I had to buy everything again in the UK and I had to kind of convert everything because I used to do things uh, on the imperial system here because that's how I, I learned. And then I had to do everything, learn everything in metric there. And then I came back again. So it's, <laughs> it, <laughs> I don't know. That's just, that's just how it turned out for me. So, so but yeah, I, 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 I moved pretty quickly from, I wanted to like have it doing that uh, L, like liquid malt extract version to kind of get an idea. And I wanted to know the full process. And that's when I went all grain. So it was pretty fast for me. Fair enough, because, uh, you know, I, I, I've i gotten one of those kits before, never ended up using it. Uh, I probably should have used it. I still got that container. I should probably just buy some like malt extract and start tinkering with that kind of stuff myself. It uh, just sounds like a blast. And in your case, Mark, did you ever kind of delve into that world of those uh, malt extracts or did you jump right into brewing with like a, a proper grain bill? Yeah, I actually draw, I, I went straight into all grain. I, I, I kind of made the decision um because I, I i'm sure you you all know this that if you watch youtube and you watch four youtube videos you're instantly an expert and you can be commenting on all sorts of facebook pages so that's what i did um i instantly became an, an expert never having brewed a beer before um i actually uh kind of shout out to toronto brewing i i, I took one of their they had a uh, a learn to brew class. I don't know if you guys remember this. There was a time where you used to go to a store and it didn't matter how many people were in there and you didn't have to wear a mask. You'd stand around and drink. That was Toronto Brewing. They used to run these brew classes. And if you took the class, they give you like something like 25% off anything you bought that day. 
So I walked around like with my tax refund check and said like, I'll take one of those, one of those, one. like it was like Willy Wonka, right? So like <laughs> they, they, somebody was just following me with a, with a calculator. So I, I, I jumped kind of two feet in. Um, so I never did the extract thing. I think that that was, you know, I have a lot of buddies who started doing that. It was something that, uh, that I went into the all grain and you make all sorts of mistakes uh, by not like what Chris said, the progression it is a little bit easier, but maybe, maybe Chris, you, you would know like the, what I didn't have was getting rid of the equipment from the previous system before. Like I, I'm brewing on what I started on right now. I know a lot of guys are just like, Oh my God, I can't get rid of these like containers or I can't get rid of these mash tons or well like that is like uh, like that's there's a lot of space involved with equipment yeah I, I, I still have a lot of the pieces i use for my, my my first setup uh stuff i didn't sell when i moved but like i still have the one gallon fermenters and stuff like that i mean uh yeah I mean, to keep adding to it <laughs> takes up a lot of space and you know looks cool on the wall behind you but I'm not in that space right now. But. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure it's great for certain types of brews. If you want to do maybe an experimental one gallon brew, or you want to brew maybe something like a barley wine that you know is going to be a little bit heavier and you don't want to necessarily invest five gallons in that or something like it'll probably come in handy at some point. Well, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you can either, I learned pretty fast where all the recipes that I, that I started reading, like once I started doing all green, everyone's like, Oh, five gallons. It's written in five gallons. I had no idea how to convert it down or scale it down or up. Yeah. So I assumed I'm like, I have to make five gallons. I have to do this. And if you jump right from one gallon to five gallons on the stove top, it's a nightmare. Like there's so many things that could go wrong trying to get enough heat out of your, enough power out of your stove to boil a five gallon. Like it, it's, a, it, you need a, a very powerful stove to do it properly. Uh, and the margin of error is just, it's, it's this all over the place. You can't, you can't get it dead center, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um, starting smaller is a bit easier because if you make an, a gallon of great beer, that's awesome. If you make five gallons of bad beer, you got to dump five gallons or feed it to yeah. someone that's going to drink it. Right. So <laughs> maybe a neighbor you can pass it off to who just enjoys beer. <laughs> it's a good way to make friends. Here's a horrible <laughs> beer I made in my garage. <laughs> Not good friends, just friends. Yeah. <laughs> Stay off my lawn. It sounds like getting into it. It's you know I hear, I hear you say getting your feet wet. You're not you're kind of really diving in head feet or feet first, head first, feet first, what have you. I can't even say it straight today. Um, we're supposed to be recording Thursday, so my mouth is all over the place tonight. Um, but uh, my question that I'm trying to say correctly is. When you're jumping into it and you talk about size and, and kind of how you get into it, what's aside from these Mr. Beer type kits, like what's the general kind of starters guidelines for setting up a homebrew kit? Like what are the basic necessities you would need to get going? And I'll let either of you, I want to start on that if you either want to lead in. I got that question out right. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, I think um, the easy way to do it, I think if you pick up, I think it depends on your space. Um, when I started learning how to brew, I was, I was living in a condo. I didn't have any place to stick huge fermenters and stuff like that. Like I had, I ended up having, having fermenters under my desk in my living room, which was very weird, but that's how it worked for me. Right. But when I moved up to like larger size, larger size, uh, uh, batches, I needed more space to do it. Um, brewing on stove top versus outside is, is another consideration too. If you're doing a, a gallon on stove top or two gallons, it's very easy to do. Uh, if you're outside, it's very easy to do five gallons and, you know, it's very simple to do one gallon. So. Fair enough. Yeah. I think if you were to jump into it, one of the first things you should do is try and um, hook up with the local homebrew club. Um, uh, the, the big lie of homebrewing is that it's, uh, it's cheap. Um, it's, de it's definitely, it eventually does get less expensive um when you kind of have your system and, and and all that locked in your first couple of years it is not you're constantly kind of buying new equipment you're buying new things um but the reason why i said like go to your homebrew club is nine times out of ten they're doing some type of bulk buy at least once or twice a year whether that be for hops or or whatever uh um the most expensive thing you you buy when you're a home brewer is is hops and of course everyone wants to make you know 
uh, Pliny the Elder, you know, it suddenly uses like two pounds of hops in the homebrew world, that would probably cost us, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks in hops minimum. Oh. Um, but but like a regular brew shop buys all that stuff in bulk. And so it's it's almost, you know, it's it's negligible for them to to throw in to throw in in hops. So that that's what it is. I do I do kind of put a, a little asterisk like when you join a, a homebrew club, just be very mindful. It's male, very male dominated. It's a very white homogeneous group. Nine times out of ten, they've all been together. They've all competed together. It feels like a little bit of a closed society. I, I actually belong to two homebrew clubs, and I've never been to a meeting. Um, I just have been part of like the bulk buys and stuff like that. But um, the more that you can buy in bulk, whether that be right right from the the brew uh, the homebrew shop or or whatever. That's your best way to save money. And there's, you know, you'll, you'll find the ingredients that you use all the time. Those are the ones that you want to have a big bag of because you're going to make a mistake or you're going to have to make a substitute halfway through because you for, didn't think you had enough mosaic and you have to throw something else random in there. So yeah, you do. Wow, that's so surprising to hear that uh, the hops are that expensive. I, I've purchased hops before for my kombucha brewing, but like I purchased them at like one ounce packages, which is, you know, tiny. And that's like super affordable, at least for me when I'm brewing kombucha. You're talking $50 for a batch. Wow, that is absolutely incredible, Mark. Wow. Sorry, like 50 bucks for like Pliny the Elder, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I suspect, Chris, you're drinking, a, you're drinking a, an ESP. You probably paid four or five bucks for the hops there yep. right like, yeah so a big that, idea needs more and, hops yeah 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 i think hops are probably the most expensive ingredient that don't really have a lot of reusable reusable factors to them too um like one thing i think the biggest thing that everybody should get into is yeast washing as soon as you do that you can buy one thing of yeast and use it eight times uh, connect with a local a, a local brewery if they're if they're pulling a batch one day to say hey do you mind if I come and take some yeast from you they'll often give it to you too like third bone here is uh, they're often getting rid of uh, London fog yeast you can just go grab a jug of it and stuff if you if you're nice to the guys <laughs> that's buck wild oh, that's wow. interesting yeah. so t- yeah. t- like so apart because we didn't want to talk about, about ingredients and stuff like that too so sounds like the most for the most part you're getting your products from uh you know these brewing clubs likely or or brew suppliers do you reach out to places like maybe um a short finger or like you said i guess you, you will reach out to breweries if possible to propagate some yeast so is that um a common practice maybe in home brewing is that something where we might it's kind of new no i i actually have never done that at the odd time yeah um i've got um there's a couple of breweries here in town if you know the like i it, i'm in milton it's not a big town um we have a pretty small group of, of home brewers around here um so we all kind of know each other and we have a little a local homebrew group and it's like hey you know someone's got extra hops you don't want then we'll want them there's always somebody messaging someone else saying hey i've got these extra ingredients i don't need these whatever it is um one of the breweries here actually had uh one of the guys that i know through this group is one of the assistant brewers at one of the breweries and they just happen to be getting rid of 50 pound bags of vienna malt so they had, I think, eight of them. So I, I ended up with two of them. I got them sitting by my basement. I've just been using the animals in my bases for anything I can, <laughs> I can use it for for like a year and a bit now. So um, there's, I mean, there's creative ways to do it. Um, I grow my own hops too. So, I mean, it, I had a bad year last year, but uh, prior to that, I was, I was bagging about, you know, five, five, or, five or so, five, maybe eight pounds of hops at the end of every season, seal them, throw them in the freezer, use them as you go. I mean, you kind of start to learn these little uh, these little crafty tricks to, to save money where you can. Yeah, Chris, I'm sure that uh, presents you with a great opportunity to maybe make a, a fresh hop beer at the end of that harvest season. That's I try cool. to do one every fall when it works out. Nice. Now, I, I do have a question about the equipment that you that you guys are talking about because. You know, you started, obviously, Chris, you mentioned the brew kit. Um, Mark, you were saying that you kind of dove into things a little bit more. Now, there's a lot of different equipment people can purchase. You can either get like a, a five-gallon pot, start with that in a bucket. You can invest a little bit more, maybe get yourself a Bruzilla. Or if you want to ball all out, maybe you can get yourself, uh, what are those, the higher-end? Grandfathers. Grandfather, you can, you know, yeah. go, and, you know, get one of those. Though, 
what are you now using to brew in your current system? Like, what is that? I'm a grain father guy. Fair. Um, I, yeah, I'm a grain father guy. I went kind of two feet in. Um, Brewzilla and I think it's Robo Brew is the other. Robo Brew. Yeah, is the other version of that. Uh, they were they didn't exist when I when I uh, bought it. I I'm not confident I would have bought them. Um, uh, Grandfather for me was I, again because I was jumping kind of two feet in. It was pretty much an idiot's guide to brewing. Like the damn thing beeps at you if you're missing a step or if you've had a few too many pints and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, I forgot my 30 minute edition. It's beeping at you or it's, it literally is walking you through the steps. Um, and my first couple, it was a confidence builder for me um, because it feels like, you know, that I watched a 20 minute video, I'm an expert now. Uh, that doesn't feel that way on brew day. Um, your first couple of times after, you know, a hundred or so batches, you feel like you can just be like, ah, whatever, it's happening, and and just, yeah, go. There. Yeah, I'm also on Team Grandfather. It's a it's been a game changer for me too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the the thing, and I had, and I only, I've only had mine for about a a year and a bit now. Um, but the thing that I specifically bought it for was the automation and the integration with the app on, on the phone. Um, I'm a giant tech nerd. I like being able to like, I'm on my phone, I'm out somewhere in public and, you know, I'm walking around with my kids or something. I'm like, Hey, you know what would be really cool if I did with that recipe, maybe I should change the dry hopping, pull up my phone, adjust the recipe off I go. Yeah. Um, and That's I think cool. it makes it a lot easier too. I mean, like I'm, I'm a dad. I got, I got two little kids on brew day. I can set stuff up in my garage, set stuff to go go be with my family, boom, time to go in and do this thing. I go in the garage for five, 10 minutes, do the next step, out I go. And um, the automation's amazing. Uh, the fact that I can try some really cool things, like I'm really I'm really getting this step mashing now. So that's like my, my big thing with all my, my farmhouse beers. I'm trying all these different step mashes to get, uh, you know, different, fl different uh, profiles in the water and try to get different enzymes to go. It, you can go uh, you can go deeper on being a beer on a um, on being a brewer when you have that extra that extra that extra bit of a safety net with it uh you're not it's i, I found when i was brewing stuff stovetop or on over like a propane burner before when you're trying to hit you're trying to hit 142 for your mash temperature you're constantly measuring it you're watching it turn the flame up turn it down add water it's like you, it's it's <laughs> It can be done. People love doing it that way. I like going, okay, 142, it's at 142. Give it a stir. My mind is at ease. It makes broody a lot shorter as well uh, and more efficient. That's, that's, my, that's my two cents on it. Sense. I mean, heck, the automation definitely would make things simple because I've seen, you know, just endless videos on home brewing and it seems like a lot of the requires a lot of precision especially early on when you're trying to extract as much as you can out of the malts it needs to be really kept at a certain range otherwise it's not going to steep the malts to get what you're trying to get out of it and then that ends up changing the whole profile of the beer at the end um that's amazing i mean and and honestly like those machines and in you you guys all chime in with this too they're not that much considering how much they offer i i get that they're not cheap machines i i get this but I mean, if you really want to get interested in home brewing and you want things to be as simple as possible, it seems like it might be worth the investment in looking at one of those. Like, it's not that bad. Yeah, I, I, for, for me, I had the, I feel like I'm going to end up here anyway, so I might as well start here. So I just kind of got that, like, it's going to happen. And, and this is something uh, I actually started, I started watching David Heath videos and it felt like he really had he had it down to a system and, a, and an art form and it seemed like that was something that just let me kind of again build that confidence and understand what he was doing uh and to chris's point the recipe uh the recipe uh, engine on Grainfather is fantastic and and i started before brewfather and even brewfather i don't use that much but um, the recipe engine, almost all recipes are kind of like open source, but uh, it's really nice to be able to have the confidence of, you know, and you could mess around with it and you don't need to personally do the math on how much, how much water you need to add or mash in with or, or it, it takes that part away from and 
that's still an art. And I truly respect the people that are, you know, out there with a calculator weighing grain and measuring water and all sorts of stuff. I'm just, uh, you know, this is not, <laughs> it's not a full-time <laughs> job for me. So I'm just kind of like, let's make this happen. Right. So. Fair enough. Fair enough. I love when you're, uh, you're you know, you're talking about recipes and, and, you know, the consistency within this tool itself, but when it comes to building a recipe or, or go, getting a recipe for yourself as a home brewer, like what kind of planning do you do? Or do you really, do you really lean on these apps to help build or existing recipes like a, a Pliny? Or do you tend to start from scratch sometimes and maybe like, I'm going to build grain up and, and create this beer, uh, you know, in my own notes type of thing. Chris, Mark. Anybody there? Yeah, um, I um, I'm uh, a, a big. Uh, I've, I think I've only brewed maybe maybe four or five kit beers. I was very like right from the get go. I was like, I want to learn how to how to mix this malt with this malt to get this color, and you know, how do I use these hot combinations? So I haven't done. I haven't. I've done most. I'd say probably ninety percent of my brewing has been personal recipe development. Um, and I, I brew stuff that I like. I mean, I, I live in the UK and I, I love British beers. I love British pub beers. I love cask beers and I like farmhouse stuff. And it's not as easy to get that stuff here. So I, I learned a lot about that through sources like, um, uh, the beer, I think it's Beer and Brewing Magazine that, that I referenced. And they, have, they post a lot of recipes and they'll show like breakdowns of how things work. And they have a lot of article. Yeah, second, let me just Google this quick before I'm getting, giving you guys the wrong information. I'm pretty sure it's beerandbrewing.com. <laughs> It is beerandbrewing.com. Okay, so beerandbrewing.com. If you go on there, they have uh, they have a recipe section, and they'll have they have stuff on here like how to brew, like for example, how to brew your best your how to make your your best dark mild, how to make your best, and they go through like dark mild. This is the malt you should use historically. The style looks like this against BJCP. As long as you're within this range of this, you're a lot. You should use you know have a little bit of roast, a little bit of chocolate, but not this, not that. So I kind of. I'll use a rough style guide and I'll use information from stuff that I've read to kind of cobble a recipe together and then I'll brew it. And then like this beer right here, this is um, a clone recipe of a, a five points uh, best bitter. Uh, it's a clone recipe I found online. I love ESBs. Try this one out. Uh, it's really good. But now I know like the next time I brew it, I can go into the, the app and I'm going to adjust it. And I, I want more, I want more. It's all fuggle hops all the way through, but I'm going to put a, a, a dry hop addition on this to make it, make it pop a little bit more and try some oats to smooth it out. And like once a lot of the stuff I do is just to kind of like the park. And once I'm there, I can figure it out about what I want to, what I want to do more with the recipe and how I want to develop it more. So. I, I've used a lot of clone recipes uh, just to understand the style a little bit more. Um, I, uh, I've done that and then I kind of feel like what I, I feel okay with the style and then I do something like really stupid, mostly just to like ruin the style for me. Like, I feel like I really like nailed this like wit beer. I was like super pumped for it. And then Bruce Lamb came along for GTA Brews and I, and I made a strawberry jalapeno wit beer. <laughs> and, and I was just like, why would I do that? And I entered it and it was, like, I was like, I, I got this like the comments of like, wow, this is the most interesting beer I've drank in three years or something like as judges comments, right? Like, so, uh, or I brewed that stupid dill pickle beer. Um, like I just, I feel like I kind of like, just like, hey, let's play with something a little bit because I think once you kind of get the basic parts of it down, you do. I also uh, find myself kind of going, well, instead of buying, you know, so fuggle hops, I have a lot of East Kent Golding hops. So I'll just kind of grab, grab what I have and, and kind of, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, when your mom's making uh, soup and she doesn't have all the ingredients, but has other stuff that can be thrown in there. That's kind of what I feel like uh, I do just a one, save myself a trip to the homebrew stop, but also just to be like, I got to use some of this stuff up because it's, it's hanging around a little bit, but yeah, it's, it is also nice also to try a clone beer and see how close you can get to what is being sold somewhere else. And, and then you kind of say, oh, they're, they're hoppier, they're this. And so how did they get there? And kind of playing around with that because that ultimately, like they're making money on it and you're trying to replicate it. So if there was obviously a market enough to buy this and to drive me to make this. And so how do I emulate that? 
Or you could nail Hogarth and add some strawberry and jalapeno to it. And ruin it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Ruin it for everybody. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it sounds like innovation is, is a key part of being a home brewer too, where you could take these cord recipes, these, these cloned recipes, and then you can do what you said. You can adjust the malt, the grain bill. You can add some oats to it. You can, you know, change the hops, hops up entirely if you want to see if you can bring it over to a different style maybe. So I think, is that a kind of what keeps you going to with home brewing is that ability to innovate and constantly be creative with what you're, you're outputting? You always want, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's, 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 it's making art. If you're a creative person, if you like to draw, if you like to sing, whatever it might be, this is, it, it's art. You know, if you enjoy doing it and you want to nail it. It's, it's, I, I've had so many beers that I've made where I, <laughs> about a year ago, I, I made a, I made a brown porter um, and I use a, and I bottle it up and I tried it. I was like, this is literally the best beer I've ever made. And I, I must have dropped bottles off to about six of my friends. I'd be like, hey, man, I left a bottle on your doorstep. Just, it just, uh, it's the best beer I ever made. Just let me know what you think. <laughs> and like, I moved into a new neighborhood. I found out a guy across, across the road from me here. He likes beer, made friends with him. I went over, I said, hey, I made this beer, the best beer I ever made. Let me know what you think of it. So, like, you just, it's, um, I think you just like when you when you nail something, you want to share it and you want other people to experience that too. And then you want other people to go, wow, you you made this? How'd you do it? And then if you're lucky enough, you happen to find someone who's a who's a big person you can you can nerd out with. And then, you know, it just the the, the rabbit hole just keeps going deeper from that point. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think the the other part as as Chris is talking, I start thinking of like disproving the myth that this isn't your grandfather or your uncle's like homebrew. Right. Like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> my uh, my my family had these, you know, they would go to the U brew shops where you would you would mix the sugar in the grain as fast as you possibly could. You'd stir, stir, stir. And then you would get six cases of beer at the end of it. And you would drink that and you had to drink it with your teeth closed because it was all full of like particles and junk. And, and that was the that was the homebrew junk that you were that that your uncle would force on you and say we got to get through this because we got another six cases coming tomorrow right so <laughs> you're drinking out of necessity and I think uh, there's there is an interesting connotation of people thinking that's what homebrew is now and it's it's definitely evolved like it's taken a step like don't get me wrong I did that mostly for shall we say the bulk purchase of it but the next step is I think what 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 Chris and, and many others are doing is, is just about kind of like there's an artistry, there's a development of it, and uh, there is there is an expert. Like we, uh, my partner and I, give it as gifts, uh, like at Christmas and and, and other things to uh, to just uh, try and be like, hey, we did something kind of neat. We're not really sure. Like we think we like it. You might like it. Um, you know, and we also brew beer that we think. Uh, others might like so if we know that we're having um, you know some people that are big into British beers we're, we're going to brew a, an ESB or a mild or something like that or you know it's a hot summer day we're going to brew some you know some lagers or something like that too and just try and keep that keep it going for the community because um, drinking five gallons of beer by yourself is like that's uh, you got to belly up to the bar for that right so meant to share <laughs> it is meant to share and like that's the part of the crazy part. like with covid right like i i feel like i went through a lot more homebrew faster uh but with covid because nobody's coming to your place or or it's so rare that you're seeing people you're just like wow five gallons like it it really feels like a challenge some days <laughs> i don't know what it is but it's like all right let's go here we go right so yeah now, lagers or ales, which do you prefer to brew for each one of you and why? I'll start with Mark on this one. Um, uh, so, so you actually, uh, there's two ways to brew a lager just for, and, and so lager is bottom fermenting for those of you who don't know, uh, and it's also meant to be lagered uh, at a cooler temperature uh, and temperature control um, is 100% what you need to do for that. And that is a, it's quite expensive and it's almost inaccessible. Uh, so when I started and I think everybody started, they brewed ales. I, um, I, I got myself some temperature control with a glycol chiller and, and did that and was able to 
um, start producing uh, loggers. They're, they're inexpensive in the grain belt. They're very expensive in the yeast because uh, you sometimes have to double and triple pitch. And then you, uh, you hold them at four degrees or, or colder uh, for longer. You can do that by in the winter without a glycol, just put it outside. Um, eventually it'll clear itself up. Uh, so I, I prefer, uh, I actually prefer making lagers. We drink a lot more of them around the house. Um, uh, yeah, lagers, I, I prefer because we drink them and I think they're a little bit more accessible rather than a big hopped beer for, uh, for the community that comes over here while well, used to come over here. Yeah. You had that great Vienna that you had this year, this summer. That was phenomenal. Yeah. 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 Ryan came over with a straw. It was embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you supplied the straw. Let's be real here. <laughs> it was the end. It was actually the, the end of the tap. That's right. We'll, call it a straw. we'll be drinking out call on the patio. Straw. We were outside, folks. We were outside, and there was only five of us. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Do you do you have the ability to do uh, the lagering at home? Do you have the a, a setup at all for that, or uh, to a degree? Um, yeah, I have kind of a ghetto setup in the sense that I have a I've got an extra fridge. Um, I've literally in the the whole time I've been making beer, I've made two lagers. Uh, and it was this past year that I made both of them. I finally stepped into it. I'm like, hey, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I debated doing a, a warmer ferment lager, like out of the above the, you know, eight degrees Celsius range. Um, so I, I, I dedicated a three gallon fermenter. I brewed a Hellas, very simple grain bill, two malts, you know, nothing fancy. Um, stuck it in a, in a fridge for, you know, two months, did a diastole rest, bottled it. It was okay. Uh, it also took way longer to do it, which I wasn't a big fan of. And the fact that I had, had to occupy most of my fridge with a fermenter I was the big deal, wasn't good. So um, the second one I actually brewed a porter in December, and I brewed four gallons of porter, and I took one gallon of porter and I put it on a lager yeast, and I have a one gallon fermenter in the fridge, same spot now. So now there's a I have like a porter lager, I guess more like a Baltic porter kind of happening. I didn't really think about it too much, um, but yeah, so I mean, yeah. So that's just chilling away. I'll see how that turns out. I Do you know. call it a plotter? I was going to say a plotter or a plotter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a, log, a log plotter. Plotter. <laughs> plotter. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I, I, you know what? It's the thing that I like is that you can always do these kind of fun little side experiments. If you make it like I, I typically make an extra gallon of wort and I do something different with it. I have a, you know, a small fermenter. Maybe I'll put a different yeast on it. Maybe I'll put you know, hops, maybe I'll fruit something just to, just to mess around. If I, if I screw up one gallon, then who cares? But if I, one gallon turns out to be amazing, then I can scale that back up and, you know, the madness continues. Yeah. I love it. So I want to know, because it sounds like, you, you know, a big part of this is learning on the fly. Um, so what is your worst beer and best beer that you've brewed? either or if you can think of it off the top of your head maybe but or something along those lines but uh your favorite personally i definitely know what my worst beer is um when i was in scotland i joined a homebrew club and a brew the first time i ever brewed a size on i'm like i'm just going for it and I brewed it and did all this, you know, I got, I got all ready. I sent it out and I got the, the worst, the worst score on that beer. And I didn't realize until after I didn't taste it. I just, I brewed it, <laughs> had the recipe, sent it out. I'm like, that's it. This has to be I, good. <laughs> took my shot, took my shot. And then like, you know, I, it's bottle conditioned for a bit. And then like, you know, two weeks after in a crack, and I'm like, oh, there's so much diacetyl in this. I was like, this is so bad. And the scorecard came back and there were some pretty bad comments on it. And that's one that definitely, definitely stands out in my head but I've, I've i've dumped beer i think you have to kind of come to come to you know the acceptance that you're going to dump some beer you know if you try and make something complicated the odds of you messing it up are way higher if you make something simple the odds of it turning out better or it, the odds of it turning out to be a good beer is a lot a lot higher too so it's a race to the bottom i feel like i have a whole bunch of like like <laughs> I, I have i have beer that didn't even make it out of the fermenter uh i've made uh I made a cranberry beer that oh, yeah. I couldn't get it out of the fermenter. It literally clogged everything, everything from dump valves to, <laughs> I, 
I put five gallons of it in and, and like pounds of cranberries because I was like, ah, it'll be great. I didn't realize that the cranberries would absorb like almost three gallons of beer. And I, I was a, a night, I still had like cranberry screen, skins and everything afterwards. That one didn't even make another fermenter. I ended up just dumping that one. Um, I've made some, I've made some colches that uh, were like uh, creamed corn. Uh, so that one wasn't necessarily great. Um, learning process. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a learning process because you, well, you have to make, it, there's no brewer regardless of home or professional that hasn't dumped beer. Yeah. Yep. And if and if they tell you that they've never done beer, don't buy any beer there, just walk out. Yeah. <laughs> they're either lying yeah. to you or they're putting something on there to cover it. And that's not necessarily great. Uh, yeah. I think there's a, there's enough breweries, I'm sure all four of us can name at least one or two breweries that every time you go there, there's diacetyl, there's an off flavor, and it, it, it just never goes away. But you know what? They're too proud to dump it and say we're going to fix the problem. They just keep putting it out and hoping people lie, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Eh? I think it's, uh, you know, we're talking about dumping. And, and I, I recall a few interviews where they say that, you know, it's you have to be proud with what you're doing. And whether the scale is large or small, um, you know, you have to be willing to do exactly that. Like, this just isn't good. I got to get rid of it. Mark, I was, where I was at your place recently and you were like, like, I'm thinking of dumping this. Tell me what you think about this. And, you know, it's kind of like in your, it's, you, you have to be willing to take that loss too. And it is a financial hit when you're brewing. And, um, but I think it's, it's a part of that chase and that learning process, I'm sure. Right. Like, all right, I did this wrong this time. So I know if I do try this next time, um, I won't do this or I might add this differently sort of thing. I think to Chris's point, you want to be proud of your craft. And uh, yeah. if you're not proud of your craft, like, and there are, there are ways, like, don't get me wrong, there are ways to save beer, right? So mm -hmm. diacetyl is a relatively easy fix. There are some things that are easy fix. Nine times out of 10, it's either temperature or time. And those things can fix almost anything. But if you've put something like, I put, I'll never use essences. I don't know, Chris, I don't know if you use essences at all. I'll never use, I, I'm, I tried to make this like Christmas beer. I thought it was going to be awesome. It was going to be like a chocolate, peanut butter, porter. And it was going to be great because, you know, who doesn't like a chocolate, peanut butter beer? And it was garbage. Like it just tasted like I was like drinking hand soap because the, the essences were just like, we're just we're just so overpowering chemically tasting and i was like okay that is not that's not what i want to be i don't want to serve that to anybody but my palate's also garbage too so i often do a lot of the here taste this is it as bad as i think it is right <laughs> which is probably not a great selling feature for the beer right off the bat right so I'm pretty sure this is awful. Do you think this is as bad as I think? <laughs> <laughs> I can't drink this. Can you? <laughs> I can't drink this. Can you stomach this? <laughs> you, you know what's funny? I, I take a lot of beer like that that I, I know is just, I would never give it to anybody. And I'll, I'll put it on the stove and boil it down and turn it into a sauce or something like that. And, Ooh. you know, put it on put it on ribs or chicken or something, you know. And there's, there's a lot of ways to not waste in that, in that regard, you know. You become well, friends yeah. with a distiller and they can get something out of it too right so yeah so we talked so i know um one of the key things you talked about is like home brewers clubs and and getting access to them what about competitions do i i know mark you have you have done some i know you you've talked to early at the beginning about your yeah your experience with that chris have you do you do or, or have you done home uh home brewing competitions a couple um i probably should do more but i think I think my confidence in, in, in brewing has gotten a lot better over the last little while, but I haven't really, you know, I haven't really taken my shot again, so to say. Um, I, I haven't really done anything, anything recently. I've done a couple small ones, but nothing where there's like hardware involved. It's more just for fun. Like, hey, here's a recipe. A dozen awesome. of us are going to brew it and try to do our own little twist on it and see what we come up with. And, you know, you get some, a little bit of local bragging rights, but no hardware to go with it. So I think competitions are good though, because it's a good way to get BJCP. So, or, so, or someone certified to give you good feedback and they're not, they don't know you. They're not going to try and be nice to you. They're just going to, you know, give it to you straight about how good or bad your beer is. Yeah. It's, it's, 
I, I've, I've done a couple. Uh, sometimes I actually find I get really great feedback from them. The, the nice part about, at least in Canada, uh, I, I've, I've heard of other BJCPs where the feedback, sort of, uh, beer certified BJ, beer certified judge but program. Judging judging judge. program? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I've heard the feedback being very mean and in some places I've never had mean feedback I've had people talking about like you should maybe think about this or you know this was spot on for the style or, or you're out of style here you should have done this or that uh it's actually quite constructive feedback I, I've, I've gotten when I when I, I haven't done well um but then the other part is like some of the feedback is this should have been aged longer and I'm like it was two years aged Right, like, oh, like that quad. <laughs> I had a, I had a quad, uh, Christian Liv. It won gold uh, at a competition two months earlier. Didn't even didn't even place, and so out of a score of fifty, it got like something like twenty five. But gold the next time I entered it. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so like so, there is a bit of a variance, and you can't tell me that. In yeah, three yeah. months, that beer changed enough to make it from a blah beer to a, a gold winning beer, right? So it, it is an interesting, so it is, you know, there's some subjectivity to it, right? Like we all know, you know, if the four of us make tasting notes of a beer, it's all going to come out a little differently of what what we all smell and, you know, what we went through that day. But it you don't put your heart into it, right? Like you enter it for the fun to get the feedback. Uh, it can be soul crushing. If you, yeah. it's like, that was my favorite beer and I got a 25 out of 50. But, so. Well, it's, it, it, it is an interesting point. And I think, you know, as somebody who had minimal to zero exposure to the current home brewing idea and, and what you what you both do and, and the, the artistry that it is and, and exactly what you said earlier, Mark, the you know, buy your six cases or whatever, like um, having to actually experience my first sip of homebrew, which was something that you had brewed, Mark, it was your California Common. and it was eye-opening for me as somebody to, as a consumer of beer who loves good beer, it was like, wow, like, you know, this is a, an amazing beer that's brewed in such a small capacity in, in somebody's house. Like it really opened my eyes on how um, the craft in, in itself is, is so much broader than what we see in our general consumption sites, like breweries and liquor stores. Like, um, the home brewing scene has got a lot of great, amazing brewers in it, it seems. And there's, there's some amazing beers coming out of it. Cause my, my exposure has been great so far. It's been small, but it's been great. <laughs> so I, you know, is is I don't really have a question. I think this is more of a statement. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of great home brewers out there that, um, yeah. that on par could put their beer beside any commercial, uh, sorry, I'm not one of them, but there are some people, there are a lot of people that could put their beer side by side, a commercial example, and and it would be a coin toss. What is the homebrew uh, and a blind taste? Yeah. No doubt, eh? There's some very good artists, like people who have studied the craft, right? So, Chris, have you ever blown, have you blown up anything? I always, I was, what was your biggest mistake? I have some great ones. Yeah. Uh, I can think of a lot. Um, I could, you know, I, I can't count how many boil overs I've had, uh, suck mashes. I think, um, one of the things that happened that I think people, it's like any skill when you level up, you want to jump to the next step. You don't want to jump 10 steps ahead. Cause I think that's where a lot of mistakes happen. And I can recall early when I started making beers and I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this beer. I'm going to put raspberries on it. I'm going to put vanilla beans on it. And like, I remember there was a, there was a, a stout that I made that I put, uh, I took vanilla beans. I soaked the vanilla. I had this huge process. I'm like, it's going to be brilliant. I took, the, I had vanilla beans. I shaved them all down. I soaked them in whiskey for like a month. And then I took those, the, the whiskey that had the vanilla in it. And I put some wood chips inside of that. And I soaked that for another little while. And then I put that in the beer and then I got chipped chocolate and I put that in, in, the, in the kettle and I put blackberry and I like, I just went like adjunct buck wild and it was like, this is going to be amazing. And it was, it was, it was awful. Like, but I think it's like, it's one of those things where like, if you go, if you, you can't jump from level one to one to 10 without knowing all the stuff in between, because I probably could have made that beer work if I understood how to actually add the, the adjuncts in the beer properly, you know? And I think it's, it's I've, I've done infinite amount, amount of mistakes like that. Um, 
I've had a, a couple bottle bombs. I haven't had any in a little while, which is which is good. So I've never had one of those. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's nothing better than you're you, you be you're asleep and it's like boom. It's like what was that? <laughs> it's probably it's probably nothing. Boom. What was that? And, <laughs> and then, <laughs> then you just don't you don't even know what, what it is. You're like ah, it's probably nothing. And then like you know a couple of days later you go check on that beer that's aging and it's just a mess everywhere. And, <laughs> <laughs> Bottle bombs. I love it. That would definitely be a terrifying sound in the middle of the night. <laughs> so if you, if there's a style that you haven't brewed yet, and we're going to close up here in a minute, um, what style would you like to brew if there's one you haven't brewed yet? I'll give it to either of you. Whoever jumps in. Do I want to brew in general or do well? Uh, well, I mean, you'll get better at it over time. <laughs> so... <laughs> You got to start somewhere, I think, right? <laughs> so one that you would like to get, do it well, but you could start by doing it and learning. I, I really, I, I personally like the AZ beers a lot more. Um, I, I don't feel like I've mastered the water chemistry and the you know, uh, you know, the temperature and the hop combination. Like I, I've made hazies before, they're fine. I don't think they are on par of where they should be. Um, and, and there's there's a lot of science to them, you know. And I, I've also made them, they've looked like swamp water too, right? So they, they're oxidized to the, to the nth degree. So I'd like to be a lot better at the the nipa the hazy style um i feel comfortable in other styles of ipa just not that one nice yeah nice juicy haze bomb courtesy of mark swamp juice baby swamp, swamp juice, juice. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and chris any style that you would go for that you haven't done you don't have to master it right away don't worry about that we won't taste if i it. had if i had the equipment um i would love to make a proper i would love to have a proper beer engine and make a proper cast oh, beer nice. uh like the way like the way that they're done in the uk where they're hopped and the beer is dry hopped and it, it's aged on plug hops so it's the character changes it's still fermenting a little bit in the cask so then the first pull of beer versus like the 20th pint are totally different in the way that they taste um there's a lot of you know a lot of uh science on the seller the cellaring side of that to get to to process and everything but uh i think if i had the equipment i would i'd probably have like instead of having hey i've got a couple taps in my house i'd be like who wants to try my casks and just you know that'd be awesome i'd be waiting outside your door yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know it, and i think it's funny too i mean it's one of those things where like i i i really like Camera, if you know what ca uh, camera is, if you Google it, it's like the Society of Cask Brewers UK or whatever. They're like trying to keep cask alive. Um, I'm surprised that that's not a thing here. Why right? there's not there's not breweries that focus solely on cask. They focus solely on uh, like I think right now with where how where beer nerd society is at. Why don't we have like an authentic Brian Heitzkaput brewery? Why don't we have a brewery that does everything authentic to traditional styles? Why don't we have a brewery that you know what I mean like I think everyone's kind of fighting over the same sort of styles. You've got to put in all these hazies. That's all the people buy. I mean, why isn't everyone going? Why doesn't why doesn't someone go left when everyone's going right? You know. Mm -hmm. But I think that's that's just my that's just my opinion. That opinion is shared right here, sir. <laughs> I share that entirely. <laughs> it's time to go left a little bit. Well, it's we were we talked about that. Just new you know styles we'd like to see as older styles. I had a. Yeah a beer to Mars last year. And I was like, well, what's a beer to Mars? And I tried it. Out. I was like, wow, that's a beer to Mars. Like, that's really good. Never had the style before. That was Salter street. Like, you know, yeah. so there, I think it's also there, there are some places out there that may not be that traditional, like not full on right heights go up, but I think they're just muddled by exactly what you're saying. Everybody fighting over the same, um, same style or, or the, the same hype. Cause a lot of it I think is also driven by what we, want to post a picture of and get the most likes out of and right Absolutely. now haze gets likes well, well if you think <laughs> about it a hazy beer is literally a beer that was designed to look good on instagram if that's where the culture is it's literally a beer to look cool when you take a picture of it yeah it tastes good 
I mean, yeah. hell, it tastes good. It tastes yep. damn good. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I think that's the problem with them too. They taste so good. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to. Or we're doing an IPA this weekend. I think, are we, Mark? We're. Uh, it's actually probably an appropriate week to be doing it. We're going to brew. Uh, Ryan's coming over. We're going to do the, uh, the Brave Noise homebrew um, version. So it's a it's a very appropriate week after. Uh, the incredibly honorable and insanely hard work that Aaron's been doing out, Aaron Bob, for that uh, little beast. It's been three very trying days. And that if there was ever strength in a woman, it's it's Aaron for doing what she's been doing, and that's you know we should all be thankful for Aaron what she's doing there. But uh, and and all the uh, all the um, stories are um, heart wrenching. Um, so, uh, there, there is the nice part about, uh, some of those things and Ryan, I see there's a black is beautiful. There, there's a lot of these big beer, um, I don't know what you call them, beer, uh, campaigns, uh, that have a homebrew component. So we've, uh, we've been able, uh, actually, if you sign up for brave noise, I don't know if you know this, Chris, you can actually get your name on. I didn't realize they put my, my homebrew name on, uh, on the thing. So yeah. That's the I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah, and, and Mark, you know, um, I just to top up on what you said too uh, about Aaron, um, it's it's an eye opener for many. I think that it, you know, it is happening here. It's always been happening here too. So, um, yeah, it's it's not easy work that it, she's doing, and, and a huge shout out to uh, you know what what Aaron is doing and bringing those voices forward. Um, I know where we all we we've all talked before many times. So I, I know that to this group is, you know, is all commenting and sharing the same with what she's doing because it's, it's an important message to spread. Well, you know what, like, and to be honest, even like when I've been reading some of the stories, it's like, you start to think like, well, I mean, I know who that is. I think maybe, or, you know, like when you hear like, shit, I might know that person. Like, and that's it. It just brings to light for me how active it is without it being, Oh, like without being aware of it type of thing right yeah that's the, the, what's, what's actually kind of i'll, I'll tack on about too um there was a couple stories about a certain brew house right on the water queen's key that i won't mention i used to work in that brew house and when i read some of those stories i actually recalled a lot of that stuff that i didn't even think about at the time uh most of it was to do with uh uniforms that ladies were wearing and you know uh how depending on how attractive you were, you got different sections and stuff. I mean, I, I, I attended bar, but I was there when that stuff kind of happened and I didn't really think much about it until I heard someone else's perspective on it. And it's uh, kind of hit home a bit, you know? Yeah. It brings it to light. It's, uh, it's good. And I'm, and Mark, I'm so glad that you, you suggested that. And I'm glad that we can be a part of that, uh, that brave noise collab just to even, uh, like you said, it's an important, important, not even weak. It's just an important message that needs to be continued to be spread. And, and the work that um, the women of the Bevolution did in the States on it, I, you know, it's being, it's being reverberated quite heavily right now in, in Ontario. So I think that's awesome. And thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate that, Mark. I, uh, I just serve them up for you guys to knock them out. There you go. Right. <laughs> well, you're, you, you pointed out my black is beautiful collab too. And you're yeah, right. Like gotcha. it's, it, it, we have seen some really cool opportunities where home brewers, can be a part of these larger movements too and showing where they stand within the the beer community because mark you brought it brought it back and and i've even in some of um, aaron's stories talked about homebrew clubs and and how they didn't feel super inclusive sometimes so it's you know it's it it it's an issue that is in all of the different areas of the community and in the small pockets and stuff so um yeah it's it's an important message and and one we're happy to help uh share and reverberate here as well so thank you for, for sharing that. And uh, yeah, I think what we'll do is we will close it off on that note. So why don't you guys stick around for a sec while we press stop on the record button. But I want to thank you both for hanging out. Uh, we do really appreciate you taking the time to talk about your passions in home brewing. Um, maybe what we should do in the future, once all these COVID rules, we should do a, a kind of a bilateral collab where you and you and Chris. Oh, Robin, we could do Robin a north south. Yeah, and we could switch up the rest. Got my vote. What about a north south cool. competition? We can do yeah. a, a blind taste. Yeah. There you go. Uh, we'll we'll bring it to the listeners somehow. <laughs> we, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That would be fun to do. So we'll plan that. 
for sure in the future. Um, but yeah, huge thanks to you both for taking the time. We really appreciate this. It's fun. Um, and we'll do it again for sure. We'll have some fun episodes. Uh, for those that are continuing to listen to us, we will be back next week with another episode. In two weeks, we've got Bebo and Chris back from Third Moon joining us. So we'll have some fun dissecting a few of their beers and just talking about their last year and a bit in the brewing uh, community in Ontario and, and the amazing progressions that they've made as a brewery. I know we all love Third Moon here. And um, we'll have some more news hopefully by the end of next week. And we can finally tell you where we're doing our first ever full on collab. So we're excited about that. We'll tell you what the style is and what we've got coming down the pipe. Is it swamp juice? Swamp juice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I got a recipe for food. you. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, we'll do it. We'll have to call it swamp juice now. I think, Robin, just because <laughs> I know it even, feels even like even if it, it is a, a Dortmunder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. And Robin, brother, as always, man, it's so good to see you and talk with you. I can't always. wait till we can connect in person again. Absolutely, me too, man. Right on. All right, we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, fellas. Take care.